<laughs> How's everybody doing? Welcome to the show. This is uh, Movies You Missed. Uh, I'm your host, Jace Cudlin. Um, and this is a this is a podcast slash YouTube channel, I guess. Um, what defines a podcast? I mean, because like, I can launch a podcast through YouTube, right? I ask these questions now. Um, just philosophically. Seven or eight episodes in. Literally ten episodes in. What am I talking about? Anyway, uh, this is the show. This is a show. I'll refer to it as a show. Um, Because this is national public radio. Um, Anyway. Uh, You know, it's it's this show, like I've said a million times already, where we discuss movies that you uh, you might have missed. You might have missed out on them. Um, Whether or not that was due to um, I wonder how long I could get away with just being silent. I wonder if it's funny. Is it funny? Or do you just think that you lost like like lost connection? You're like, oh, did it pause somehow? Um, but no, you didn't lose connection. I just paused for a really long time because uh, I just I forgot the basic premise of the show. Even though I, I you know, I know that it's you know movies that uh, you know you just might have missed out on. You didn't catch when they were released, and then or you might not have even been alive when they were released, and then you know it just got lost in the ether that is you know tens of thousands of movies released a year every year for you know forever until the end of time I guess um let me know if you can hear me properly let me know if this is a good volume I don't know how are you gonna let me know I don't know anyway um but yeah so um yeah, we talk about you know movies that I personally find underrated or overlooked you know underappreciated um and in this season we're covering sequels because i think sequels just as a concept you know a follow-up to an original idea kind of some you know get a they get they get a bad rap i think they get a bad rap um just because people um think they're inferior by nature because they're trying to follow in the footsteps of and, or recreate the magic of something that was originally good you know and people are just trying to cash in on that concept or what, they're trying to take whatever people liked from the first one and just recreate it um, but you know I think there's a lot of magic in that I think I think if you can create something that people like even if it's not like the whole thing even if there's just some parts of it that people like, if those things show up in the subsequent movies, a lot of the times that's enough. You know what I mean? I like, like in today's movie in particular, which by the way is Jurassic Park three. Um, I I mean there's there's so many like oh, homages and just straight up you know it's a continuation of course. So there's a lot of just similar elements. I mean the same characters. Um, kind of the same situation same people behind the scenes behind the camera more or less Um, and it's just like if you can create something that people like and then just kind of making sequels with those same elements but then like adding a little new stuff adding a little bit of the new but not too much of the new you can just you can make movies and I guess just like TV shows anything that people will want to consume especially people like me I mean I think the human race kind of craves the same thing over and over again our brains you know I'm no doctor but you know brains recognize patterns and patterns are pleasurable to the brain and people and like our brains crave them Um, you know people love consistency people love what they love and just like over and over and over again so I think like I think Paul Rust comedian um, star of the TV show Love and I Love You Beth Cooper and then host of With Gorley and Rust 
uh, movie podcast uh, once said that a good sequel is like a good cover of a song. You know, it's still the same song, but just with like certain new elements or twists added. And I think that especially is what Jurassic Park 3 is. Like, I think it's Jurassic Park 3 is like you take Jurassic Park, same characters, same kind of setting, um, and you just tweak it a little bit, you know? I think, and of course they try to do that, they did that with Jurassic Park, like the Lost World, Jurassic Park 2, and um, Jurassic World, and all those sequels like it's like uh, you know just tweak it a little bit if you tweak it too much it becomes too like too foreign to what pe- and too far away from what people know and they don't like it you know what I mean so yeah here we are to honor and pay our respects to Jurassic Park 3 what I feel is a crin- cr- cr- crin- criminally underrated movie um, and um, truly um only one of like three Jurassic Park movies that I truly, truly condone. Um, uh, a straight up banger, if I may say so. Gonna take a bite of something. Sorry, give me a sec. Sorry, I'm eating a pumpkin roll. Sorry, excuse me, excuse me, sorry. But yeah, my personal history with the Jurassic Park, sorry, I came in a little loud there. Um, <clears throat> my personal history with the Jurassic Park um, film series um, is actually a pretty, a, kind of a brief one. I was not less necessarily a, a dinosaur kid. Uh, I have some business, so I'll discuss that later, but like... Before we get into the nitty gritty, but yeah, I'll just um, I'll say that I wasn't like a dinosaur kid. I wasn't like one of those children that like it's like oh give me all the action figures of the of the dinosaurs, give me the dinosaur books. I want to know all their names. I want to know all their functions, their functions because they're devices. What am I talking about? Um, but like uh, yeah, my friend Jared was actually um, like a dinosaur kid and he loved dinosaurs and he's like the only person that I know. That like loves these movies as much as I do, and will always talk about them with me. Um, and he told me he would come on the show only if we did the Lost World Jurassic Park two. But because I told him we were doing three, he's like, "Yeah, I really actually don't like three. I don't agree with what you're saying that it's an underrated movie." So I I bow out, and I'm like, "Well, I respect it." Um, but yeah, personally, wasn't a dinosaur kid. Didn't um, even see these movies probably until I was a teenager. Sorry, there's a loud truck going by. Or a school bus or something. I don't know, it's really, really loud. I'll take this opportunity to have another bite and finish off my pumpkin roll. Get some water as well. Sorry. Um, uh, yeah, but like I didn't, like I said, I didn't see these movies until I was like probably in high school, I think. Because I think that's like when I started my film journey. And I think before high school, I was like kind of, I watched movies like every person does, but I didn't like, I wasn't like making it like a, like a, I wasn't like a passion, you know, it was just something I casually did. Um, as like most people, you know, casually enjoying movies and not like committing whole, um, large fractions of your life to like their viewing and studying. Um, but yeah, I, uh, I remember actually my friend Jared uh, actually gave me a VHS copy of Jurassic Park to watch when I was a kid and I never watched it and I, he's like, hey, you've had that for like six months, can I have that back? And I was like, oh, uh, whatever, sure. Um, so yeah, I think I watched it for the first time when I was in high school. And I loved it, of course. Jurassic Park 1 is a classic. Um, definitely a top 10 favorite movie of all time. Just because I think it has... I mean, of course, the script is airtight. Uh, acting is phenomenal. Um, 
score is amazing special effects you know out of this world in like in literally insane for the time um like groundbreaking uh and just cozy you know just a really cozy 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 warm beautiful movie that just makes you feel good inside you know i don't even have like nostalgia for it but like it just makes me feel comfortable and safe um even though i mean of course there's parts of the movie that are kind of terrifying because like people are excuse me pardon me um being eaten by dinosaurs um being eaten eaten alive um and there's a severed arm at one point um but yeah, it's like really just an incredible groundbreaking piece of filmmaking. And I think I've watched it every, probably about every single year, maybe like every two years ever since it I first viewed it. It's an amazing movie. Uh, Jurassic Park 2, The Lost World, even though I said that incorrectly, um, is definitely a steep drop off in my opinion. I don't necessarily love that movie uh there's definitely parts of it i really like um like the eddie eddie car death and the fact that john hammond is in the movie uh and that transition between the dinosaur roar and jeff goldblum yawning in the airport um but that's about it i think there isn't a like a a likable character in that movie um and I mean, like, the direction and the scoring and, like, the effects are stupendous, of course. Um, but, like, I don't know. It's, like, a lesser villain. Uh, Jeff Goldblum is not necessarily anyone's favorite character from the first movie, so I'm not sure how he became the lead in the second one. But, and, like, Julianne Moore's character is, like, so flat to me. Um, and then, like, Vince Vaughn. I'm like, why, what are you even doing in this movie? You're just pointing a camera. It's just like... And then, like, I, I saw Jurassic Park... Because I think I just... I think I actually... Now that I think about it, watched all of them in preparation for Jurassic World coming out in 2015. Um, and I fell in love with one, and I fell in love with three. Because I think three, despite its, like, oddities and quirks and the flaws it has, I think it matches the tone, uh, the, like, the light, likable adventurous tone more because like not only does it like have Alan Grant and Ellie and the characters that you actually like from the first movie uh, I think it adds some characters that are like maybe you know if not a little over the top but just like really also kind of fun and likable too um, and then of course you know I saw Jurassic World Jurassic World in the theaters that was incredible um, seen Jurassic World a million times since then too but then of course uh, Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom really kind of lost me and then I haven't even seen Dominion still and that, I think the DVD release date for that was like a month ago but I I, I don't even know if I I'm, I mean I'm gonna try to see it eventually but I'm not in, in any rush and that being said I will say uh, that Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom has risen in my esteem after multiple viewings I saw it in theaters I said whoa that was a total turd but after watching it like once or twice, like, you know, on DVD, I think I like it a little more, but it's still definitely like a off the rails and kind of like, um, I don't know, an asinine, clueless kind of way that I'm like, oh, this isn't really like, that's what I like it. Like, I think it, that's what it like deviated. It like tweaked it too much. It deviated too much from what we're used to, which again, I don't know. I guess they kind of had to, you know, I mean, because, like, what are they going to, oh, man, what are they going to remake this movie for, like, a fifth time and still keep it just people running from dinosaurs? Uh, no, there had to be, like, a human cloning element or some new, like, new spin on it. And I, even though I, it, well, that's the thing. Did there have to be? I don't know. Um, if they would have just made Jurassic World and then, like, oh, in that world we think dinosaurs are just running around on an island again you know we're working under that assumption just no one go on that island i think i would have definitely been okay it seems as though if this like human cloning and humans coexisting with dinosaurs angle was what they were shooting for the whole time um if that was the case no one could tell from the beginning it seems like it just kind of fell into that along the way uh, and i don't think 
I or anyone I've ever spoken to has really cared for the direction that these movies have went. But that being said, Jurassic Park 3 is light, it's airy, it's fun. It's a, it's a bop, really. It's just fun. Fun watch if you like action and thrills and you're looking for just a quick romp. Uh, akin to the first Jurassic Park because everyone loves that movie. You know, this is your movie. Um, but yeah, anyway, back to back to business. So that's my personal history with Jurassic, the Jurassic Park franchise. Jurassic Park 3, 2 is like a comfort movie. I think I've watched it a bunch of times. Like when I'm feeling blue, I'll just put it on. Um, I own it on DVD, VHS... Uh, and I own Jurassic Park 1 and 2 on Laserdisc. They never released Jurassic Park 3 on Laserdisc, so I, it's impossible uh, for me to own that because they don't make it. But And I, I don't make Laserdiscs. Don't know how to do that. Don't have the capability. Um, but yeah, I'll just be like, you know what I feel like watching? JP3. Toss that DVD in the player, you know? Uh, even more so than 1, I think, because I think I want 1 to retain the magic and the hold that it has over me, so I, I don't watch that all the time. Um, but like JP3, I'll, I'll even throw on just sometimes three times a year, sometimes no times a year, just whenever I feel like it. Because it's just pure fun, and I'm not in awe of it. There's no magic to lose, really. It's just like, you know, kind of good. Pretty good, you know? But yeah, uh, so anyway, some business up front, even though it's not up front, we're like 17 minutes in. Um... This is the penultimate episode in our sequel or summer sequel series, um, which I'm sad to say, because that means it's coming to an end soon, coming to an end next week, which is a real bummer. I've had a lot of fun. I've had so much fun doing these, like doing these sequels, talking about these sequels uh, every week. Not every week, but like you know, over like throughout time over the summer at no regular interval. Uh, until I hit crunch time and had to really step it up. But, um, yeah, I must say, I've, I've really been on a tear here, you know? I've had I've done, like, three episodes in three weeks, and I'm going to do another one next week, so I'm kind of killing it. Anyway, but it's been a blast, really. Um, and I plan to, of course, keep this up. You know, we know the... We know, you know... Oh, I guess I, uh... I'm, I haven't had a chance to announce this yet because it just came to me during this week. But uh, uh, for the Halloween specials... Uh, I'm going to do the Halloween the Halloween 4, 5, and 6, the Thorn trilogy of the Halloween movies. Um, just because I can. I think those movies are really, like, just not stupendous filmmaking by any means, but I think they're very, very enjoyable uh, and interesting. Um, and I think it kind of fits perfectly because it's Halloween. You know, we're doing Halloween specials and I'm doing Halloween movies. And it kind of fits in with, uh, you know, how we did Halloween 2 this season. And I'm just a huge Halloween fan. I'm going to be watching those movies anyway, of course. So, um, you know, that's what we're going to be doing. That's going to be the Halloween specials. We got those lined up. I'm going to start the second week of October and do one a week until Halloween. So I'll take, uh, after next week, I'll take like two weeks off, uh, if you'll permit me. And then um, after that, uh, who knows when the winter season of erotic thrillers is going to be, uh, is going to be starting. I've already got all, I've got ten movies lined up for that. And I've got a guest lined up for that erotic thriller season. And I've got a guest lined up for uh, slated, or I've got a guest slated to uh, come on for the Halloween specials. Maybe more. We'll see. Haven't really put my feelers out for that at all because I just figured it out. But uh, when I know, you'll know. So that's gonna be fun. That's the timetable. Uh, I'm just, but again, couldn't be more proud of this season. I've just, I've been having a lot of fun um, discussing these films, um, and I think I'm gonna try to do like themed seasons for as long as I can. Uh, and even, I have like a master list of movies I want to cover on this show, so I may even just start looking through that list and like separating those movies into like loose categories to just like, I think it helps keep me on track better, um, which just means more content for you. 
the listener. Um, so yeah, that's what we're working with. Um, and I'll let you, I'll tell, I'll fill you guys in on what the next, the last episode of Sequel Summer will be at the end of this one. Um, which I, I've been really excited about. I've been saving this all season. Um, the two I was most excited about, about were, uh, well, the three I was most excited about were Halloween 2, RoboCop 2, and then this one. So I had to just, I had to, I'm like, I gotta do RoboCop 2 and Halloween 2 right away because I'm just, I can't, I cannot, you know? But then I managed to save this one all the way until the end. Not that I wasn't excited about every single one of them, because I was. I'm a big fan of every single movie I've done, obviously. Um, so, yeah. Here we are. Let's talk Jurassic Park 3. Uh, Jurassic Park 3 is a 2001 American science fiction action film uh, directed by Joe Johnston. Right off the bat, isn't this crazy that this movie came out in 2001? Like, you think Jurassic Park movies and you think the 90s, you know? Because the first one came out in 1993, second one 1997, I believe... And then this one, you're like, oh, it looks the same as the other ones. It has the exact same vibe and feel and look. Um, but it is... It came out uh, post two, post Y2K. Which is pretty nuts. And it's a, like came out in the new millennium. Like, this movie is still 21 years old. But, like... Jurassic Park is almost 30 years old. So it's kind of just crazy to think about that, like, this third movie came out, like, nah, eight or nine, eight years after the first one. So, um, yeah, they, I, they, not, yeah, think about it. They really took their time between all of these. I mean, it's a four-year gap between every single one. So, which nowadays you would never, that, that doesn't fly. I think Jurassic, I think uh, within seven years they've come out with three Jurassic World movies. Which I guess is kind of the same span. I don't know. I guess, you know, movies like these Jurassic Park movies kind of take a lot of time, you know. I mean, but you look at like Sonic the Hedgehog and they had like two movies in two years. Or like the Saw movies, they had like one every year, you know. Sequels just don't really take a lot of time to like uh, gestate and like to mature uh, before they get released. Like they used to. Um, but yeah, this is, like I said, the third installment of the Jurassic Park franchise and the final film in the original trilogy. Um, the film's plot follows a divorced couple played by, uh, Tia Leone, Taya, Taya Leone, and William H. Macy, who trick Alan Grant, played by Sam Neill, uh, and his associate Billy Brennan into, uh, helping them find their son who went missing on the island of Isla Sorna, which is the secondary cloning uh, dinosaur island site that the Lost World Jurassic Park 2 takes place on. Uh, the film was released on July 18th, 2001, uh, and it grossed $368.8 million against a budget of $93 million. So this movie, despite being critically um, kind of, not panned, but like, mixed to negative reviews was a box office like smash hit people i mean because it's stress i mean if you put jurassic park on something it's gonna make a ton of money especially because i think people liked i mean they love jurassic park one obviously and then i think they liked jurassic park 2 enough to the point where they were like let's go let's go just let's see the new one see if it's not bad yet you know uh this movie was directed by joe johnston um who I didn't know much about Joe Johnston before, uh, you know, doing this movie on this podcast, but uh, he's actually done a ton of movies that I love, like um, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, uh, the original Jumanji with Robin Williams, October Sky, um, the Benicio Del Toro Wolfman, and Captain America the First Avenger. So, I mean, we all love Captain America the First Avenger. Pretty, pretty nuts. Um, this movie was uh, written by Alexander Payne and uh, and Jim Taylor, who uh, Alexander Payne and Jim Taylor wrote about Schmidt, Sideways, The Descendants, Nebraska, and Downsizing, and those movies were directed by Alexander Payne. And then there was, uh, I'm sorry, there was a third, 
writing credits. Um, Peter Buckman, who I uh, couldn't really find anything about on the internet. Um, I think he wrote the screenplay for Aragon. And then he wrote the screenplay for The Foreigner, that movie with Jackie Chan. Uh, yeah, but I couldn't find much more about this guy. Uh, the director of photography was Shelley Johnson, who, you know, love to see a woman cinematographer. That's a kind of, I think that might be a first for this show. Um, but I believe that, um, oh yeah, she had a, she had a weird assortment of movies that she, um, that she DP'd for, which, uh, are Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Secret of the Ooze. Uh, a, f a, per a fan favorite, personal favorite of mine. Love that movie, actually. Um, the, the Disney movie Sky High with Kurt Russell and Michael Arangiano, where, you know, it's, it's like super powered high school. Um, the Wolfman, Captain America, working again with Joe Johnson. Uh, the Expendables 2 and Hurricane Heist. So, just kind of all over the map in terms of subject matter covered in her in the movies she's worked on, and also quality. Uh, but yeah, this movie has a, sh a huge, awesome cast. Uh, you know, stars Sam Neill, who, you know, was in Jurassic Park 1. Uh, he was in The Piano. He was in Omen 3. Uh, he was in the pos he was in the movie, 1981 horror movie that I love called Possession, which is a really weird one. Uh, actually out of print, hard to locate nowadays. Um, William H. Macy, who we know from Boogie Nights, Magnolia, Fargo... Uh, and his stint on his stint, you know, his starring role on the TV show Shameless. Atia Leone, who is in like Madam Secretary, Bad Boys, Deep Impact, and The Family Man with Nicolas Cage. Alessandro Nivola, who was in Face Off, and then you know recently The Many Saints of Newark. He plays a uh, Doctor Grant's assistant, Billy Brennan, uh, and then Mike, uh, Michael Jeter was in this movie. He was in you know Tango and Cash, Fisher King. Patch Adams, Green Mile, etc., etc. A lot of credits. This guy is a very uh, prolific, like character actor. And then uh, Trevor Morgan, who's like a little kid, does a lot of little kid stuff. I think he was in Barney. You know, he's a child actor uh, who plays the son, the aforementioned son that was lost on Easel Sorna that needs to be found. Basically, the catalyst for this entire movie. Um, this movie dist was distributed and you know produced by Universal. And Amblin, which is like Steven Spielberg's production company. Uh, Runtime for this one is 92 minutes, which is uh, the shortest Jurassic Park film to date. Uh, whereas Jurassic Park 1 and Jurassic Park 2 and all the Jurassic World movies are all over two hours. This one is only an hour and a half, which I think is part of its charm. You know, it's nice and tight, no fat to trim, and you can just throw it in real quick, give it a watch, go to bed, you know? Whereas like Jurassic Park, Jurassic World, they're like two hours, ten minutes, and you're like, eh. I don't know, as an adult on the go, I don't know if I have that time. Uh, the movie, the scores on this one movie, critically and, com uh, cri critically and commercially, uh, what am I talking about? Uh, the scores, Rotten Tomatoes, 49%. Aggregate score, not not good. IMDB, 5.9 out of 10. Not good still, but um, not bad either. Uh, Metacritic is 42%. Oof. Uh, and Google users, 83%, like, to this movie, which, um, you know, Google users are always a bit um, softer on every movie. Uh, how, how did I watch this movie? I watched it on my Jurassic Park triple feature pack, uh, but it is also streaming on HBO. So, for you out there. Uh, and, like, I don't know, I guess, like, why... Why is this? Why was? Why would you miss this movie? I think, of course, like I said earlier, that it was a financial success at the time of its release, meaning that a lot of people saw it, obviously. And I think a lot of people probably have seen this movie, but I think a lot of people haven't, or like don't like this movie. And I think so. I guess like in terms of movies you missed, it's not one you missed, but it's definitely like an underrated movie. Really, like people hate this movie and we'll talk more about that later because I, uh, I found some articles 
discussing the Jurassic Park movies. And people really don't like, like, like my friend Jared, I talked to some guys, some guys at work and I was like, yeah, I'm doing Jurassic Park three. They're like, oh, prefer two. And I'm like, oh man, you're so dead wrong. But yeah, I mean, this movie of course has, it's like acolytes, uh, and supporters, but I think generally speaking, people just don't care for this one. Um, and I can't understand why it's like, like, and that's the main reason I thought to cover it was basically to get my thoughts out there. And to just try to convince you that it's not as bad as you think. And, like, I definitely don't think that people in recent years are given this much of a watch. I think this kind of fell off mostly because of negative reviews. And, like, people, and, like, yeah, it's just not high in people's esteem. People don't care for it. And that could prevent, like, people like, ah, oh, you know, Jurassic World's coming out. Should I watch all those movies? They're like, oh, just watch the original. Maybe two. Definitely don't do three. And they're like, ah, okay. You know? So just like for future generations and posterity's sake, I'd like to go on record and officially just give this movie a thumbs up, dude. Give it its flowers, because it's just it's a tight hour and a half of fun and amusement. And it's just a wild ride, you know? And it's it's like just like akin to the first one and that is just a enjoyable ride for the whole family but anyway yeah we can just get into this baby bit by bit break it down scene by scene because I have let's see here one two three four five five pages of notes oh and I and I don't want to like not give anyone credit where it's due because this, um, I think this script comes from an idea by David Kep, which was the writer of the previous two movies. And that this script, though it was mostly Alexander Payne and Jim Taylor, um, also had, there were also uncredited uh, rewrites by John August, who uh, wrote like Charlie's Angels and Charlie's Angels Full Throttle. And uh, Big Fish and the movie Go, directed by Doug Doug Lyman, uh, and Corpse Bride. So he did rewrites. I think, and originally, it was written by. There was an original script by Craig Rosenberg. About and like that's where the idea of like someone being a marooned on Isla Sorna comes from. But I think that draft was ultimately rejected, and then the Buckman draft, uh, the Peter Buckman draft, but that uh, that was also rejected as well. So sorry, I don't want. I, I I know I said I would talk about that movie, but then I I wanted to get into this because I forgot to write it down, and I wanted to talk about it. But yeah, so I think they retained certain Buckman elements. Um, but Alexander Payne and Jim Taylor, who are like a duo, um, revised that script and made a lot of uh, revisions. And then John August came in. And then that was the script we see before us. So um, Buckman is still credited, but I don't know how much of his original stuff is really, really used. Um, so yeah... Uh, now we can finally get into the nitty gritty and talk about the movie the actual events of the movie anyway um, so yeah uh, you know it opens on you know the universal logo you know going around you know universal in big letters going around the planet earth which is you know we love to see it this is actually the only the second universal this season following Halloween 2 because we've had a bunch of 20th century foxes in a row and then we had some new line cinemas in a row uh, but yeah, so we got a we got a Universal since the first for the first time since Halloween two, and then boom, our first Amblin, which is um, Steven Spielberg's production company, like I said earlier. And then uh, it, the Amblin logo on this one is really cool actually, um, because the Amblin logo logo has like uh, like water I guess around it, and the water starts to like shake and like ripple because of dinosaur footsteps that we can that we that can be heard. So that's pretty neat. Um, so then we then flash to, um, you know, 
wide out shots of an island and it's going around this beautiful like picturesque island which uh, the island is revealed to be uh, Isla Sorna which is like the island that Lost World Jurassic Park takes place on where they like created the dinosaurs and like successfully bred them not bred but cloned created the dinosaurs on that island before they shipped them to Isla Nublar which is where Jurassic Park 1 takes place uh, so it says, uh, you know, the caption on the bottom of the screen read, Isla Sorna restricted. Because I guess since the events of Lost World Jurassic Park 2, where all those people got killed, um, the Costa Rican government has made this a no-fly zone. No one can get on or off this island. We think. Because it says restricted, but then, you know, it cuts to this uh, this child and man, and they're, you know, they're strapped together, they're parasailing uh, near the island like a boat like they're like tethered to a boat that's like in the water obviously that's where boats go but then like they're in the air like flying through it on a parachute i don't know why i'm describing parasailing to you but they're parasailing like right by this island because i guess they want to get and try to get a glimpse of dinosaurs and it's like oh it's like a dad and son maybe doing fun stuff together you know what i mean um And, uh, I don't know, they, they, they're, like, gabbing, they're like, whoa, isn't this fun, or whatever, uh, and then the guy, the, the guy, the older dad-looking guy is, like, a guy that I know from somewhere, um, it's, like, an actor that you've seen in a bunch of stuff, but I can't necessarily place his, like, I know his face, but I can't necessarily place it, he's, like, a definitely that guy, um, probably been in a lot of tv stuff i think um but yeah so they're like being cared like they're like parasailing being tethered to this boat and this boat is like raised through the water and they're trying to get as close to the island as possible so they can get glimpses of dinosaurs like this son and dad which of course this is like i think a lot of people had fault with this as like a idea they're like who would possibly be stupid enough to do this like, what person, after all those people died, would want to go, like, maybe, like, poachers or something? Or, like, like big political, like, corporate dummies who, like, want to go and, like, oh, we extract the dinosaurs, we, you know, sell it on the market and make millions or whatever. But, like, a father, like, a father and son duo is going to risk this? Like, this guy's going to risk this child's life? And I guess later on it, it's explained to us and it makes a little more sense. Uh, I guess I'll just say it right now. This is like, this kid is like Tia, Tia Leone's kid. I feel like I'm going to say her name the whole time. So I can't wait till we introduce her character and I can just call her by her character's name. Um, but this is her and William H. Macy's child. And this guy is like the boyfriend of Tia Leone now that uh, WHM, William H. Macy, uh, and Tia Leone have split up. And now she's dating this new guy. And this new guy, of course, is like, oh, I'm cool. I'm trying to be a cool, hip, stepdad, whatever, type to this kid, so I'm going to take him on this cool, dangerous thing because he likes dinosaurs. But even so, pretty dumb. Um, but yeah, the boat that is that is tethering them, um, this is actually a really, really cool scene, uh, and I think it's shot really well. Uh, and it's just written awesome. Like, just a, this, it's like a, just like a cool script point. Because, like, the boat, like, the guys who are piloting the boat, driving the boat... I don't know how boats, what do you, what would you say? Boat people reach out to me. Um, do you drive a boat? Do you pilot a boat? Do you, are you steering, steer the boat? There's the people who are steering the boat. There we go. Boat people, no need to reach out. Um, I figured it out. So the people who are steering the boat, they go through this fog, right? And we, we're looking at the boat from like the people's perspective, like the kid and the, the, the dad. And then like, there's some violent tugging on like the rope that's tethering them and they're like whoa what the heck's going on what's that and then the boat emerges from the other side of the fog and bang those people who were piloting the boat gone the boat covered in blood and ripped to shreds they were killed by dinosaurs i guess but in a cool way because it's shown you know it's like it happens in the fog so you don't get to see it also probably saves them a bunch of money not having to depict dinosaurs killing them so really genius uh, but yeah, so the boat is not being steered, stored, steered. Is that the correct past tense? Steered by anybody. So it's like 
and it's like it's going wayward. It's gonna crash into some rocks. So this dad and kid have to like unhook themselves from this tether, and then they just go swoop, and they just like coast onto the island. Like there's like a oh no, we can't get the straps done. The boat's gonna crash. If the boat crashed, like would you die? What would happen? Would you, the boat crash? By the way, isn't even necessarily violent. Um, the boat doesn't explode or anything. It just kind of drives up on the island and kind of flip tips over. Like, I think they might have actually been fine. Um, but I guess in this situation, what the hell are you going to do? Um, but yeah, the wind carries them onto the island and their fates are left unknown. Scary. Um, but then we flash to Sam Neill, our boy. You know, Dr. Alan Grant, paleontologist. And he's talking to some child who's playing with dinosaur action figures. And he's like, hey, those are herbivores. They wouldn't fight each other. Now, these velociraptors, remember he has like a velociraptor kink. Um, these would play with, these would fight each other in battle because they're carnivores. And then uh, enter Laura Dern as Dr. Ellie Sattler, also from the original Jurassic Park. Um, and they're her kids, I guess. Those are her kids. And she has, she has like married and had kids with some other dork that's not Alan Grant, which is like a total bummer because in the first one you thought they were romantically linked. Uh, but I guess it didn't happen for them. Also, I guess if they were romantically linked, she probably would have had to be in this whole movie. And I don't know if she wanted to necessarily be in this whole movie, the actress. So it kind of worked out, I guess. Um... But yeah, the other dork that she's married to is the is actually the husband is the like the dad of the the girl from that show Pen Fifteen. If anyone's seen Pen Fifteen, um, what is her name? And like it's Anna Conkle's father in that show. He's like a pretty good actor. I've seen him in other stuff. He does a decent job at being uh, an Alan Grant placeholder who works in like it's you know he works in like some sort of like legal field and you know his 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 uh you know they're they're like the next scene is them talking over dinner um and he's talking about his job and it's super boring and it's like oh ellie settled for this super boring guy rather than you know date alan but um but yeah the guy the guy the dad from pen 15 leaves and it's just ellie and alan and they're discussing how alan has like theorized that raptors actually were able to vocalize in like a sophisticated manner um based on what they saw on the island and the further research that he's done that like oh they had they could communicate with each other they can talk they were actually more intelligent than primates and by the way this is like a huge point um this is like a like a huge um plot point basically in this movie so like keep that in mind raptors can talk um so then it, it jumps to um Alan Grant at uh, a seminar that he's giving about this very topic, which is raptors being able to speak. Um, again, they're really pounding you with this idea that raptors can speak. Um, I I wonder how many times I say um during this podcast. I'm just I'm just like I'm looking at my notes, but I'm just gonna not say anything at all. But at this seminar, Grant is like raptors can talk, pretty cool, right? And like people there are really bored. Um, there I did it again uh, which I don't really understand because like seminars are voluntary right who's making you come to this seminar you don't have to act so bored he asks though after he's done talking he's like anyone have any questions and a bunch of people raise their hand and then he's like anyone not have any questions about what happened at Jurassic Park a bunch of hands go down or if you have a question about what happened in San Diego the events of Lost World Jurassic Park 2, which I was not a part of. Go ahead and put your hand down. So then no one is like, there's only one person raising their hand and he's like, hey, what's your question? And that guy's like, he stands up. He's like, isn't all of this study of dinosaurs and old raptors kind of a moot point now, considering that like real live dinosaurs are alive again and they're on that island that you were on in Jurassic Park? Which causes my boy Alan Grant to just go in on this cat. He literally starts bashing in Jen and John Hammond. And he's like, listen. Dinosaurs have been extinct for like 65 million years. What's on that island? That's Those are not dinosaurs. Those are an amusement park attraction. 
those are those were created in a lab you know manufactured those are not real dinosaurs those are like monsters and he's like oh what John Hammond and InGen did something I don't want to talk about but those are not real dinosaurs real dinosaurs and learning about them can only be found through in fossilized rock which is my speciality and I just talked about it for a million years so shut up um and then some dumb girl is like, so why don't you, you really wouldn't go back to that island and study them if you could? Which he uh, <clears throat> he responds with, no force on heaven or earth could get me on that island, believe me. And I'm like, seems like Cap, sir. Seems like there wouldn't be a movie if that were necessarily true. Um, could you imagine, though, if he just said that and then he wasn't in the rest of the movie? <laughs> Like he wasn't like that was the truth. He was just like, "Yeah, no force on heaven and earth can get me to that island," and I mean it. And then he's just not in the rest of the movie, or it's just the, the movie is just about him being an archaeologist slash paleontologist. Would have been super boring, right? What a weird hypothetical I'm, I'm suggesting. Um. Uh, but yeah, then there's this weird scene that is kind of confunctory. Um, not knowing what I know later, which is like, there's this group of like three mercenary looking guys. One of them's talking on a phone to somebody saying like, oh yeah, we'll be ready. Oh yeah, I got a crew. Oh yeah. And then one of them, blow they're in some sort of weird airplane graveyard where there's a bunch of broken down plane parts and they're testing out like rocket launchers blowing up planes with them. And like later we found out that these are the people that are going to accompany our main characters to the island and kind of shepherd them and guide them and be there to protect them but like you don't know that now so you're like who the hell are any of these people what a weird scene like i don't know just i feel like this whole scene could have edited it out i actually almost didn't say my note about it because i'm like is that even necessary but i just you know it's a it's one weird weird thing uh but then we cut to we cut to fort peck montana where uh dr grant and his associate billy brennan played by Alessandro Nivola, are they're digging up dinosaur bones, babe. They're, you know, like brushing them off and stuff. That being said, I know, like, I, I, I thought this movie might be trouble because of my lack of um, dinosaur expertise, I guess. Like, I don't know what kinds of dinosaurs are what, bro. I know a couple. I know, like, the big five, you know. I couldn't tell you which one's the Stegosaurus. No idea. I know it's like, um, is it the one that has, like, the shell? I don't know. I have no idea. They really didn't teach us a lot about dinosaurs in school at all. See, no, I looked it up. I was wrong. Stegosaurus has like the spine, like the that looks like leaves going up its back. Uh, but yeah, I don't, what's the dinosaur with the shell? Isn't this fun? You try, me, uh, me, a grown man, trying to figure out what dinosaurs are what? Dinosaur with spikes on back. Yeah, no, I, that's a that's a stegosaurus, dinosaur with turtle shell. What is the turtle shell looking one? With turtle shell. Man, this is crazy. What dinosaur has a turtle shell? Man, I am striking out. Dinosaur with hard tail. Oh, Ankylo. Ankylosaurus. Yeah, I've never even said that word in my life. Uh, what are the types of dinosaurs? How many types of dinosaurs are there? Sorry about this tangent. I'm getting a... Uh, how many dinosaurs are there? There's like three, uh, roughly 700 species of dinosaurs? Oh my god. Like, I know the ones that are in this movie. I know Triceratops. Um, what's the one with the long neck? That's in like the first Jurassic Park? That's also in this movie? Dinosaur with long neck. Brontosaurus, that's it. Sorry about that. Um, I had to learn about dinosaurs. <laughs> um, but yeah, so these guys are digging up bones. Uh, and Billy's like, hey, Dr. Brennan, I gotta... Dr. Brennan, hey, Dr. Grant, I gotta show you something. Um, it's this cool new device called a, a, a prototyper that I bought, which this scene is just crazy, by the way, because I got to go, I got to go in. Um, 
because Billy's like, hey, Dr. Grant, i got to show you this device. It's called a prototyper. And this dude uses this thing called a prototyper, and it it basically 3D prints a Velociraptor resonating chamber, which, uh, cool trivia I find out, the, like, the, the resonating chamber you see is actually that of a dog just enlarged. So they straight up 3D print this thing, but they call it a prototyper. I was just like, whoa, first of all, 20 years ago they had the technology of 3D printing? I only heard of 3D printing like six years ago. But apparently it was, 3D printing was around at this time, but they call, but they for some reason didn't call it 3D printing. In this movie they called it prototyping. And I, was, like, I wrote down, I'm like, did this technology exist? Was this like... Or were they like Back to the Future 2-ing us? Were they just like predicting what's gonna exist and then it came to fruition? But no, this shit was real back then. But yeah, he prints out, he prints out this thing like the, and he starts making the noise. And Dr. Grant's like, yeah, dude, this is the exact shit I've been talking about. See, they can talk. They were able to speak. But while they're in this tent looking at this thing, they're interrupted by uh, William H. Macy, who, whose name is Paul Kirby of Kirby Enterprises, supposedly. Who, along with his wife, um, want to convince Alan Grant to take them and their uh, and their and their guides to Isla Sorna. Uh, and they take Alan Grant and Billy out to dinner to discuss this. Uh, and they're like, yeah, we're uh, we're adventurers, Paul Kirby and Amanda Kirby, played by William H. Macy and Taya Leone. Just so I can establish that, so I can stop calling them William H. Macy and T. Leone, because those are um, a lot for me. <laughs> um, by the way, T. Leone is a total smoke show. I'll say that right now. Laura Dern, total smoke show. Moving on. Um, but yeah, so they take him out to dinner, and they actually go to this like little dive bar, which I thought, he's like, we'll treat you to dinner. We'll take you out. And they go to like a bar. They go to, like, a bistro, which I thought was weird. But uh, Alan Grant orders something called an ice pick, which I've never heard of. He literally says this. Ed- they're like, hey, what do you have? And Alan Grant says, ice pick, catfish. And I'm like, what the hell is this guy talking about? But I guess an ice pick is a drink that has vodka and, like, lemonade and tea in it, which actually it sounds delicious. I think I might order it next time I go somewhere. But it's literally like an Arnold Palmer mixed with vodka. So it's really interesting. He's like... But he calls the woman whose name is Cat, he calls her Catfish. He's like, ice pick, Catfish. And I was like, me and the entire world went, what the fuck is this dude talking about? <laughs> um, but yeah, Paul Kirby goes into the fact that like he and his wife are adventurers. They've been to like, you know, 2K. They climbed like Mount Everest. They've been on a bunch of adventure trails. And now they want to go to like fly over Isla Sorna. And he wants them to be their guide and point out dinosaurs and stuff. Uh, and, you know, Paul Kirby says that he's in the businesses of import, export, and emerging markets. Which, like, what the hell are you talking about? What does that mean? That's not a business. Those are economic terms. Um, but, yeah, and Alan Grant's like, no, 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 you should find someone else. I don't really want to do that. I don't really want to go back to that island, nor should you. And you wouldn't be able to see anything from there anyway. So uh, my answer is no. And then William H. Macy is like, well... I'll pay you a shit ton of money. And he takes out his checkbook and he writes a number down to Alan Grant. He's like, for your research, because I respect what you do. And then literally, boom, the next scene, uh, Alan Grant is on a plane headed for Isla Sorna. So I'm glad they didn't drag out that scene and make um, make it like a, a like a prolonged, hmm, do I do this? Do I not do this? Hmm, I don't know. So much thing. Like, literally, Paul Kirby's like, hey, man, I'll back up the Brinks truck for you uh, if you come with me. He's like, yeah, sold. Uh, and then, yeah, we, we he's on the plane, and we see these mercenaries from earlier. So now you're like, oh, I guess that's why they showed this this scene, but that could have totally been cut out of the movie. But I actually, if they cut that scene out of the movie, it, it would have been probably under 90 minutes. Um, but yeah, one of the merc- mercenaries is Michael Jeter, so you know right off rip that he's the one that's going to survive the longest because he's the only well-known actor. Um Uh, and of course, it's this plane ride where Alan Grant falls asleep, and then like he seemingly wakes up, 
and then everyone from the plane is gone and there's a velociraptor next to him who talks to him which people have like hated that scene and always shit talk and bird dog that scene because of how silly it is but I think it's kind of funny um but yeah, so when Alan Grant... Because Alan Grant's like, oh, wake me when we get there, Billy. And he goes to sleep. And it's funny because he takes his hat off and puts it over his eyes like Indiana Jones sleeps. And like Mom and Dad sleeps. Um, but once he wakes up, we, the audience, flash to the front of the plane where um, we hear a transmission from the Costa Rican government that reveals that this charter does not actually have access to be here to fly in this area. Even though Paul Kirby swore that he uh, that the Costa Rican government, through his business dealings, um, had allowed him and given him permission to fly, but apparently they didn't. But the guy just switches off the radio anyway because he's a mercenary. He doesn't want to hear this shit. But yeah, so they get to the island, and that's why Alan is woken up, obviously. And there's a bunch of cool scenes of them flying over scattering dinosaurs. Could I tell you the names of those dinosaurs? No, no, I could not. Um, but yeah, it's a beautiful, very picturesque scene because there, you know, you see the plane and the plane is like coming toward you, and it's like rolling down, like rolling over, like descending like plateaus and into a valley, and there's dinosaurs running, and they're getting pretty close to the ground. It's pretty cool looking. Um, but Kirby, Paul Kirby, actually directs them. He's like, "All right, just find a nice place to land." And Alan Grant's like, "Whoa, wait, what? We can't land on this island. This is a restricted area." Also, it's incredibly dangerous. We do not want to land on this island. And Grant gets up, and they, they start arguing, and Grant's like, no, 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 we can't land. We absolutely cannot land. And then he gets up, and he's obviously, like, exasperated. Um, but he's knocked out. Like, one of the mercenaries comes up from behind him uh, and, like, hits him over the head with a gun, and boom, he's knocked out. And when they wake up, boom, they've already landed on the, on the island. Uh, this mercenary, by the way, has a cute line where... Billy asks, he's like, oh, so how do you guys, know, how do you know the Kirbys? Uh, and the guy's like, oh, f from f church. Like, it's a lie off the cuff, and it's like a silly one. But yeah, so Alan wakes up, and they're on the ground. Um, sorry. Um, and then, like, Mrs. Kirby, Amanda Kirby, Tia Leone, Why? Why do I have to say her name? I said that I didn't want to, but here I am saying it a bunch. Um, yeah, um, it's like screaming the name Ben. Ben, where are you, Ben? Over and over and over again. And you're like, who the hell is Ben? Um, but, you know, it's obviously like they're looking like the mercenary guys are setting up a perimeter. And Alan Grant's like, what is going on? I have no clue what's happening. Who is Ben? Why are we searching for a Ben? Like, obviously, the Kirbys didn't necessarily, you know, weren't necessarily forthright with their exact reasoning for wanting to come to this island and wanting Dr. Graham there. But yeah, um, so, like, Alan Grant's pissed. And he's also like, hey, Mrs. Kirby, you got to stop yelling. There's a lot of dangerous dinosaurs in this island, and you're going to attract them. Because she's hollering at the top of her lungs. Um, ben, 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 where are you, Ben? Over and over again. But yeah, so then, naturally, lo and behold, this yelling attracts a giant angry dinosaur who, um, we see the trees rustling, we know it's coming, we hear the roars, and then Alan Grant is like, we gotta get everyone back on the plane, we gotta get the hell out of here. So everyone, you know, it's the mer two of the mercenaries run out of the woods, they all get on the plane, leaving the mercenary who knocked... Dr. Grant behind actually um, and they, they like they like get the plane move and they're like we gotta go it's like going down the you know the makeshift runway plane and not like plane like P-L-A-I-N like cause it's like a prairie plane and they're like they're using it as a runway it's a grassy field okay and they're like gearing up to and then the like this bloody mercenary guy Cooper who knocked out Alan Grant earlier evidently goes to church with the Kirby's he runs out and because he, he's like, please don't leave me, please don't leave me. But then, boom, right behind him is this giant dinosaur who chomps the guy down and also gets in the way of the plane to where the plane has to veer off and it hits the dinosaur and then spirals. 
into the into like the nearby forest and crashes and like ends up stuck in a tree. But then you know, boom! This dinosaur is on them like white on rice, and he's like attempting to pry like open like the plane with his like claws and his teeth and stuff. And you're like, whoa! Our gang might not make it out of this. They might die. Um, but the dinosaur actually gets his little snout, even though it's not little; it's giant. It gets his giant snout stuck in the opening of the plane, and they're able to. Oh, the plane, by the way, falls out of a tree because the dinosaur's you know messing with it, and then they, you know, they see this opportunity and they all run. Oh, and also um, the African American mercenary who piloted the plane, Nash, is uh, gobbled up by the dinosaur too before the rest of the group can escape. Um, but yeah, so they're running, and they run into the dense forest, uh, and they they flee into like through trees that are like too thick for the dinosaur pursuing them to get through. So it's funny, there's actually a line where Alan Grant says, whew, I think we lost him. And then he parts some, like, tall grass so they can keep moving. And then they, boom, immediately encounter a T-Rex feasting on a dead dinosaur. And it's like, oh, oh, Alan. You, you know, Murphy's Law, you know, you just had to say it, you know. <laughs> and, and then, boom, another Alan Grant hilarious line. He says, uh, nobody move a muscle. Because, you know, like, their vision is based on movement. But everyone just everyone just turns tail and runs immediately, except for him. And then, so they're all getting they're all like you know being pursued by this T Rex now. But then, bang! The group runs into the Spinosaur, the Spinosaurus, which is like the the Spinosaurus is the one that crashed the plane and killed those two guys. And then the Spinosaurus and the T Rex are going at it. They have a duel. Which I guess there were like three additional minutes of this fight that they cut down. I don't know why. I don't know who wouldn't have wanted to see that. Um, but you can see that if you get the, the DVD. It's in the deleted scenes. Um, but they have a fight. They're gnashing at each other's necks, calling at each other. Before the T-Rex actually gets kind of bodied and slammed on the ground. And then the Spinosaurus straight up snaps this. T like literally he gets a hold of the T-Rex's head with like its, its jowls his jaws and then just turns the T-Rex says super fast snaps its neck and kills it like he's Steven Seagal or something that's crazy um, also it's kind of a subversion because you think the T-Rex is going to be the new big is going to be like the big bad because it was in the last two movies but not Jurassic Park 3 baby Jurassic Park 3 is not playing by the rules okay I mean it is but like I said it's tweaking it to a certain extent it's the same thing big predator just a different big predator Spinosaurus you know Check the DVD cover. Inside the Jurassic Park symbol is not a T-Rex anymore, babe. It's Spinosaurus. Uh, yeah, but during the skirmish that between the T-Rex and the Spinosaurus, our, our gang now reduced to five people. The Kirbys, Billy, Alan, and Michael Jeter uh, make their getaway. Uh, and as soon as they get, you know, they get out of harm's way, they regroup. Alan Grant straight up punches... William H. Macy in the face decks him obviously for tricking him and basically kidnapping him onto this island uh, and he like demands an explanation and uh, William H. Macy explains that they are looking for their son who is like I said the boy from the beginning who you know got lost on this island or around this island eight weeks ago um, and they you know they give this sob story about how the Costa Rican government won't help them because they weren't supposed to be here anyway and the U.S. government won't help them because, in Paul in Will, in Paul Kirby's words, uh, the kid is probably dead already. So with no other option, they turn to Alan Grant because Alan Grant had been on this island before. But little do the Kirby's know that Alan Grant has never been on Isla Sorna before because Alan Grant was not in Jurassic Park 2. He was only in Jurassic Park 1, which took place on Isla Nublar. Which I guess, like, actually can be... Like, do you guys remember... Do you guys, the audience, remember in the beginning of this movie, at the seminar, when he was like, hey, if you have any questions about the San Diego incident, put your frickin' hands down, because I wasn't even there. So I guess, like, people just assume he was there, because he was at the thing in the first one. So, just like those people, these people are confused. 
and they, they they literally brought Alan Grant under false pretenses and like in due to ignorance because they didn't know he's never been to this island anymore and he's just as lost as they are um, but yeah Grant is literally like hell with saving your kid I'm getting out of Dodge Billy we need to make for the coast let's move which is hilarious because they're like well aren't you going to help us find our son he's like no dude your son is definitely probably dead also you lied to me to get me here and now my life's in danger screw you I'm out and he bails but then they follow him because like they're going to follow him because he's the only one who seems like he knows what he's doing but yeah and it's revealed that you know William H. Macy and Miss Leone are divorced and they're like bick- they're like bickering but then there's also a scene where she's like oh William H. Macy you've lost a lot of weight you look really good and he and he's like oh well you look really great too by the way Tia Leone in this movie does not look great because she has this weird short choppy haircut that looks terrible she looks like Pete Wentz or something And it's funny when they're in the middle of them bickering. Because they're like all just walking through the forest trying to get through the coast at this point. Um, uh, Mrs. Kirby is talking to Mr. Kirby. And she's like, well, what are we doing? Why are we not looking for our son? Why isn't he looking for our son? Where are we going? Why are we going to the coast? Uh, And William H. Macy's like, oh, well, because Mr. Grant said so. And she's like, oh, Mr. Grant says this. Mr. Grant does that. Why are we listening to him? And literally, <laughs> William H. Macy is like, well, what's the point of hiring an expert if we're not going to use his advice? And it's like, yeah, that makes sense, William H. Macy. Way to logic check that woman, the hysterical woman. Um, but yeah, as they're journeying across the, the land in the forest, they come across uh, the downed parasail. Like, it's caught on a tree. They, they're they like, oh, that's the parachute that, like, the... that um, the guy, the guy whose name is Ben Hildebrand, um, like Tia Leone's new boyfriend, who brought the kid here in the first place. That's what they came on. Um, and they have, they find a video camera, with like that, like the kid was holding, which reveals all the footage, outlining what happened to them and how you know the the wind. After they detached from the boat, the wind blew them into this tree, and they were caught in the tree, and then the kid managed to escape. Which, like, the video confirms that the kid has, like, made it to the island alive. And that is somewhere on the island. But then, oh man, it's revealed... um, That Ben, that the guy from the video, the guy who I was like, what is this guy? I know him from somewhere. That guy is frickin' dead. Because Alan Grant and Billy are like, hey, let's get this parasail down. We might This might come in handy. And then, boom, that guy's corpse falls out of the tree because that guy is dead. And he never made it out. He couldn't make it out of the harness and things ate him. Oh, yeah, I have a note about Tia Leone's hair being bad and choppy. Uh, but, yeah, they pack up this the parasail for later and they forage on, you know. And they come across raptor eggs. And they're like, whoa, cool, raptor eggs. This comes back later, but, you know, it's cool. Because Alan Grant is just like, whoa, raptor eggs. I didn't know these, uh... They weren't supposed to be able to be reproduced. It's crazy that they were laying eggs and stuff. Um, But yeah, after the raptor eggs, they come across near that an abandoned in-gen facility. Um, which are like, you know, like the cloning, the buildings where they cloned the, the dinosaurs or whatever. Which it's funny because like, these, like, I don't, I don't want to nitpick too much because I am, like I said, a fan of this movie. But like, it's been eight years since Jurassic Park 1. And us, we can assume that it's been like eight years since these buildings were in use. But, like, these buildings almost look like old Mayan ruins or something. The way that, like, all the windows all everywhere are busted up. And, like, everything's dirty and grimy and kind of breaking down and nature is reclaiming it. These look like Mayan ruins or something. They look like the, like they were destroyed and haven't been used for 50 years. Like, in Jurassic World, which is set straight up, like, 22 years after Jurassic Park 
they go to like it, they go to the old ruins of the Jurassic Park from uh, like on Isla Nublar, and it looks like these ruins, but it should look like that in Jurassic World because it's been like twenty five years almost, whereas it's only been like eight years since these buildings were abandoned. They shouldn't necessarily look like this. Um, but yeah, so they come across the this facility and they go inside to try to find shelter or whatever, or they're looking and they're looking for the kid too. I guess at this point. Um, there's this funny scene though where <laughs> William H Macy is at a vent at like these abandoned vending machines at this facility, and he's like, mm, "I'm hungry. Does anyone have any quarters?" And he's like going through change in his pocket, and then Billy just comes out of nowhere and just kicks through the glass and just starts taking chips and snacks and stuff because it's just like, "Hey, William H Macy, this is an abandoned building on an abandoned island." Who are you? Who's whose money? Whose pocket are you trying to line with this money right now? Obviously, and then William H Macy like tries to break into his vending machine, but his foot just bounces off the glass because you know he's like a little whelp and like a little uh, piss and wimp compared to big strong Billy. But yeah, there's a, also like someone is like, oh, so this is how you make dinosaurs, huh? With all this equipment, and then Alan Grant goes, no, this is how you play God pretty cool line but yeah they're like looking around looking for the kid and uh mrs kirby is like looking at these glass tanks that have like dinosaur fetuses and stuff in them and there's this one that she comes across which seemingly has a raptor head inside of it like a severed raptor head but then the eye of the raptor head like focuses and blinks and then, boom, you realize that this freaking raptor is just standing just creepily eerily still behind behind the test tube tank thing. And it's really, actually kind of like a really eerie and scary scene. Because uh, then, boom, it appears out the other side and it's chasing, it's chasing our group. It's chasing them all through the facility. But, like, Mrs. Kirby was, like, looking right at it. She's like, oh, man, a severed raptor. And she's looking at it all close. And then the raptor's like, what? Oh my god, a person! And he just he just goes around and starts attacking them. Um, but they manage to like trap it behind a door and are able to escape. But Grant, Doctor Grant, notices that when the Velociraptor is trapped, it starts vocalizing and calling for help. Because remember, raptors can talk. But yeah, they they the group run away and they like uh, there's like a dinosaur stampede for some reason that they like that they like get involved with but then they're able to like branch off and hide in some woods woods hide in a forest near there but the raptors there's more of them now because the one called for help they um managed to um chase them into the forest and they actually uh, they injure like like they like they over like they overcome and like trample and puncture with their claws Michael Jeter poor Michael Jeter who's had some pretty quippy throwaway lines at this point by the way his name is Mr. Udesky so uh, Michael Jeter is a is a is Polak in this movie um but yeah so he's like uh he's like injured and seemingly killed and uh while well, the rest of the group makes it up into the trees and they're like oh no Mr. D- Udesky we gotta go back home he's still alive um but it's revealed that, like, Udesky has been put in this clearing and left alone to die to try to lure out the rest of the group because, you know, Velociraptors are smart. They're trying to trap the people and lure them out uh, because they're geniuses. Remember, raptors are geniuses. Uh, they're really trying to drive that point home for some reason. Oh, and I, it's worth mentioning that Mr. Mr. Grant, Dr. Alan Grant, played by Sam Neill, uh, is separated from the main group. Uh, and he's actually cornered by the raptors before he is saved by these mysterious smoke grenades that are thrown by this mysterious individual, which disorient and confuse the velociraptors, um, allowing this individual to lead Dr. Grant in a way and into his hideout, which is an overturned tanker truck. It's a pretty cool hideout. And it's like, uh, you know, it seems cozy in there. It's like a kid's clubhouse. Because guess what? It's it's that child Eric that they've been looking for. He just saved Dr. Grant. And I guess he's, he's been hiding out 
um, and eating like military rations inside this overturned like tanker truck. Uh, and he's like has all the he's like he has all this like he's like in for some reason this kid's wearing like a like a hood and he's wearing like this heavy garb to disguise himself don't know why this like this kid literally looks like Boshk from not Boshk but he looks like one of the bounty hunters you know the one from Star Wars that has all like the like the the garb on like he has almost like a turban type facial dressing on even though I'm like, hey man, we're not in the desert, you don't need to look like that. Um, but yeah, Eric and um, Dr. Grant, you know, they eat a bunch of canned bean rations together and discuss um, Grant's cynicism in, in, in his books towards dinosaurs ever since returning from the island. Uh, and the kid reveals that he survived this long by eating rations and mostly hiding and staying near the compound in case someone found him. And you know, you see, you see that this kid is pretty resourceful. This kid's a pretty smart kid to have survived for this long, right? Um, the kid has also, I guess, procured dinosaur piss to hide his scent from the T-Rexes. Which actually kind of reminds me of the scene in the movie Land of the Lost with Will Ferrell. Where Will Ferrell like covers himself and drinks T-Rex piss to try to get away from this T-Rex. <laughs> we should cover Land of the Lost on this show, man. That movie's actually really fucking funny. Pardon my language. Um... But yeah, Alan Grant is like, where did you get this piss? How did you get this? And the kid's like, you don't want to know. Which I'm like, which there's a similar joke in Land of the Lost, actually. Where Danny McBride is like, so you just stood underneath of a T-Rex as he pissed and collected this? That's really weird. Um, but yeah, they also discuss Ian Malcolm. Because Alan Grant is like, oh, did you, you read my books. Did you read Dr. Malcolm's books? And the kid's like, yeah... It was really preachy, and everything's chaos, 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 and he just seems so high in himself, which I, I don't know, I thought was maybe like them dragging Ian Malcolm because they didn't like his last movie and consider this a superior sequel than the other one, which starred Ian Malcolm as the main guy. But yeah, we cut to um, William H. Macy and Tia Leone. Um, and Billy and they're looking for Dr. Grant and there's some cute moments between them where you're like, oh, maybe they'll rekindle their relationship. You know, there's some care, there's some likable characters in this movie, you know? You're not really, but you're kind of rooting for them to get back together, if anything, for their child's sake. You know what I mean? So, yeah, Eric and Alan, there's, like, now two parties, basically, that we're following. That we're following. Like, one is Dr. Grant and this kid, and the other is Billy and the, uh, the Kirby couple. Uh, so Eric and Alan decide to make for a ship on the side of this, like, river that they see. Um, but then they're actually diverted by the sound of um, Paul Kirby's satellite phone. Which is like the satellite phone. They tried to use it when they landed, but they couldn't get a reception. Um, so like this was like Paul Kirby's satellite phone, and like Alan and Eric hear it ringing, and they decide to follow it, and they follow it to this giant like giant like fence thing, like that's like obviously for like a dinosaur enclosure. Um, but they see on the other side of the fence, hey, whoa, it's my mom and dad and Billy. And they like, you know, they, they meet each other at the fence and they put their hands through. And they're like, oh my gosh, we're so happy to see you guys. This is so great. How did you find us? And the kid is like, oh, dad, I followed your, I heard your satellite phone. Um, and I, you know, we followed it here to the fence, to where you are, because I assumed you had the phone. But then wait, what's this? William H. Macy's character hasn't had the satellite phone since they landed because Nash, the African-American pilot, actually had the phone and he was eaten by the dinosaurs. So how are they hearing the satellite phone? And then they hear and it's the ring of the satellite phone and then they all turn around and right behind Dr. Grant and Eric is the is the Spinosaurus standing 25 feet tall and standing impossibly still because guess what what's this brother 
the ringing sound is coming from his belly because he ate Nash earlier. And then everyone's like, oh, shit. This, it's over. We're done. The Spinosaurus barrels at them quick as a whip. And Alan and Grant are like, Alan and Grant, Alan and Eric are like running along the length of the fence trying to find an opening. And they do. They manage to get through before the Spinosaurus can eat them. And it's like, whew, what a sweet relief. But that sweet relief is short-lived because guess what? The Spinosaurus gets a running start and he charges the fence and he just barrels right through it, busting it up. Uh, and, but then he, But then they run into another building nearby. And everything is, seems kosher for the moment. And, you know, I, I was like, oh, they kind of slipped through that fence pretty easily. I thought that had been too easy, their escape. Uh, and then, whoa, Spinosaurus breaks through the fence. But then, yeah, it was kind of too easy because they just get in a building. Uh, so they regroup in the building. And then uh, Billy had, oh, I forgot to mention, Billy had lost his bag. But Dr. Grant had picked it up. So now that they're reunited, Billy's like, oh, hey, you grabbed my bag. I'll take that back. And Dr. Grant's like, yeah, it's okay. I don't mind holding it. Just give me a second. I'm trying to get my bearings. And Billy's like, I really want the bag, Dr. Grant. Which Dr. Grant is like, hey, that's pretty sus. Let's open up this bag. And he's like, you know, me and the audience and Alan are this one and the same. Because we're like, why does Billy want this bag back so bad? Turns out in this bag are, are Velociraptor eggs. Billy stole the raptor eggs when they came upon them before they, you know, went in that first facility. Like, and that's like why the velociraptors have been after them so much, been giving them such trouble because Billy stole their freaking eggs. And they're just like, you know, it's activating their maternal paternal instincts to get their freaking eggs back, Billy. Why would you do such a thing? And Alan Grant is pissed beyond belief, dude. He 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 brings the hammer down on Billy, gives it to him hard. Like honestly, a little too harsh. He literally says to Billy, he's like, "You've put us all in jeopardy. Why would you do this? It's so irresponsible." And Billy's like, "Oh well, I just thought if I brought these eggs back and sold them, that we'd be able to fund the dig for another ten years or so." And it's like, and you know, I just you know, I had the best intention in mind. I'm sorry. And <laughs> Alan Grant is like, stone cold, just says, "Yeah." Some of the worst things imaginable have been done with the best intentions, Billy. I consider you no better than the people who built this place. And it's like, oh my god, dude. I can't believe you just cooked Billy this hard. Like, Billy has this forlorn look on his face like he's about to blow his freaking brains out any second. Because Alan Grant just disavowed and disowned this, his, this, him his friend. <sighs> but yeah, our hero's journey on. They go further into this um, building, which like opens up into this little enclosure. Um, like the building branches off into this series of like catwalks and scaffolds, like that go like down the side of this cliff, uh, and it, like it it branches off into this bridge that crosses this chasm. And they're like, okay, let's all cross the bridge now. Uh, and then Doctor Grant crosses the bridge, and he's like, it's safe. Go ahead. And then. Mrs. Uh, Kirby crosses the bridge, and then it's Eric's turn. And as Eric's walking, as, as Eric is walking down the bridge, uh, we cut to Alan on the other side, and like he sees all this like dinosaur, what appears to be dinosaur fecal matter, like dried and on these hand railings. And then he looks up and he sees that like we're in a bird cage. More specifically, we're in a pteranodon cage, baby which are like the pterodactyl, like mini pterodactyl bird type dinosaurs. Uh, and then one actually lands. As Alan realizes this, one lands right in the middle of the bridge, right in front of Eric. Um, and it like steps out of the fog right in front of him. This is a horror movie, by the way. This is a scary sequence because Eric hears, hears like this noise on the bridge. Uh, and he's like, Mom? Mom, is that you? And then this pteranodon, this giant dinosaur puppet steps out. He's like, this ain't your mom, boy. I'm here to murder you and eat you. And it's like kind of scary. Um, really cool, really eerie. And this um, this pteranodon picks up Eric and flies away with him. So it's like, oh man, this kid who we've been working our tails off to save just got abducted again. 
But Billy, seeking redemption, dives off the side you and uses the parasail to like give chase and he's like parachuting and the wind is carrying him and he's like directing it using these arm strap thingies i don't have any life experience i don't know what these things are called um but yeah so he's like chasing the pteranodon and the pteranodon drops eric into its nest to be eaten by its children um but Billy drops in, swoops in, scoops Eric up, um, and then safely drops him in the water. But then Billy is caught by a gust of wind. Um, and his like he's like he's like thrown up against the rock wall, and he's like caught in the wall. So like he has no escape. Meanwhile, the rest of the gang, the Kirby's and now Dal and Grand are being pursued by a different Pteranodon which Alan Grant straight up kicks in the face, giving them enough time to head through the door and lock it on the other side. But Billy, in the meantime, falls into the water um, and is unfortunately seemingly killed, much to the chagrin of, like, and disappointment and sadness of Dr. Grant and Paul Kirby, who give chase, but, like, he drops into the water and then he's, like, just basically, like, seemingly, like, picked apart and like pecked to death by the pteranodons a group of three of them as he like is like swept down river and out of out of our line of vision oh man and like this i gotta mention this because this is there's this like as we're watching billy like flow down the river being eaten by these pteranodons um like, it's literally, we're following, the screen is following him, and then the screen passes this pteranodon, and there's this crazy, crazy, scary shot of this pteranodon literally turn, like turning its head ever so slowly, slowly creepy, and it's this creepy-ass pteranodon puppet. It turns its head so slowly, and it just looks right at you, because you're what you know, you're Alan Grant and Paul Kirby, you're seeing like you're like it it's like from their perspective. It's a POV shot. And to see the pteranodon like look at you, it looks right into your soul, dude. I can't even explain to you how terrifying this was to me. The first time I watched this movie. It gave me chills. Scariest thing I've ever seen in any horror movie. In any movie. Scarier than anything I've seen in a horror movie ever. You gotta look this up. I have it as a GIF on my phone, and I use it to react to things that I, re I text for my friends that are really stupid. Um, um, but yeah, our, our main characters, minus Billy, because he's gone forever, um, manage to escape the enclosure and lock the door on the Pteranodon. But the door, we see as after our characters flee, didn't close all the way and suddenly swings back open. I mean, in the tray pteranodons are free to come and harass them again if they want to but yeah they make their way to this boat and they get the boat uh like you know they push the boat off the shore and are paddling it and they get it started because the boat actually for some reason has gas and a working engine um but once on the boat by the way that sequence with like the in the pteranodon enclosure in like the bird cage as alan grant calls it spoiler alert my best sequence in the whole movie really action-packed Billy's sacrifice is kind of like heart wrenching, but also like it's a you know it's a heroic moment for him, and there's a lot of scary tense scenes with the pteranodons, obviously. Um, but yeah, once on the boat, um, Doctor Grant like expresses he's like, oh that's I I can't believe those are the last words I ever said to Billy, and that he you know he's dead now I basically called him a monster and I called him evil and that's the last thing I'll ever get to say to him and that was like my son slash brother character so it's kind of sad um but yeah these guys are they're they're um they're they're rolling on the river they're making their way to the coast to hopefully get picked up um and they actually while they're like cruising they hear the satellite phone and they get all scared and they're like, whoa, whoa. But then they look over to the shore and they just see that there's a bunch of piles of dinosaur poop, dinosaur dung. And they're like, hey, the satellite phone must have 
passed through our nemesis, the Spinosaurus, and came out the other side. So we should go get that satellite phone so we can call for help. So they were they dig through a uh, dinosaur uh, dinosaur bunk basically to like retrieve the the phone, which is like I guess kind of a callback to Laura Dern digging through dinosaur poop in the first one. Speaking of Laura Dern's character, uh, Grant attempts to call Ellie with the satellite phone. Uh, also, it's raining. While this is happening, it started to rain on the island. Uh, and, you know, they attempt to make contact with Ellie because, like, you know, the phone has been through a lot at this point. Um, you know, it was inside of a dinosaur. It's been on the whole time and has... Mr. Kirby is who's the owner and proprietor of this satellite phone is like hey you got about one more call make it count so Alan decides to call Ellie Sattler played by Laura Dern you know the character from the first movie we talked about her earlier you remember um but her dumb baby answers um and he's like hey listen I need you to give the phone to your mom this is a real emergency I need you to give the phone to your mom and the baby's like eh, okay man. being distracted by Barney or whatever because it's a dumbass baby um but then, hey, out of nowhere, we see the sp uh, spine of the Spinosaurus rippling through the water. And then, boom, it pops out of the water. Boom goes the dynamite. hey -o, pops out of the water, and it's attacking him. Uh, it's ripping the boat apart. It, uh, like, our characters are in a main chamber on the boat. This Spinosaurus straight up rips that part off and throws it into the water and our main characters are starting to sink into the water and all, you know they're going to be trapped underwater um, also make note that the Spinosaurus has ripped open the gas tank which apparently were full for some reason uh, and gasoline is just pouring into the water but yeah Alan manages to communicate to Ellie because the stupid baby gave the phone to her you know his mom eventually and she's like, wait, Alan, what's going on? I can barely hear you. You're breaking up. And Alan is like, sight B, sight B, send help, before he and the others are dragged underwater and she loses connection. But yeah, they might, they managed to swim out, um, but the Spinosaurus is still right on top of them, and he's about to straight up m murder them um, before William H. Macy, a total wimpy pleb, schlub character, decides to be a hero for the first time in the movie. And he climbs on top of the crane, um, and he's like, "Hey, hey!" And he like is like shooting the Spinosaurus with flares. Look at me! Look at me! Uh, well, no, okay, sorry, I misspoke. Alan Grant, a as the as the dinosaur is distracted by Paul Kirby making a bunch of noise, shoots the dinosaur with a flare, but and the flare just bounced off the dinosaur. It's a flare. That's a dinosaur. It's not going to do much, but. The flare falls into the water, ignites the gasoline in the water, sets the dinosaur on fire. So yeah, this is a pretty cool scene. Um, and the dinosaur, in its rage, like destroys the crane, knocks William H. Macy into the water. There's this whole dramatic thing where it's like, oh my gosh, is William H. Macy dead? What's going on? What's the deal? Oh my gosh, our poor dad. And they're like crying and shit. But then William H. Macy just pops up. He's like, yeah, I'm alive. I'm right here. You know, they barely give you time to warn William H. To mourn William H. Macy before you just, it's revealed that he's alive. So yeah, and I didn't really discuss that in as much detail as I probably should have. That's like the climax of the movie. It's like the main final um, battle. Because uh, for some reason the dinosaur gets set on fire and he flees and that's the last we see of him. Um, movie's basically almost over at this point. And I actually, I must say that, like, I think I see, like, people had a lot of qualms with the movie about a lot of different stuff, but I think the abrupt kind of ending is where it, like, is where is people's main point of contention, which I get. Like, this scene um, is, like, very tight and fraught, and the Spinosaurus um, is attacking them, and... You don't know, like, oh, are these people going to be able to use the satellite phone? Are they going to be able to call for help? Are they even going to survive this dinosaur attack? But it's like, it's like, it's kind of brief. And I wish they had fleshed this scene out a little longer. Because, like, you know, as I've said, 
the last bit of the movie should be the most exciting should be the best part when I choose my best sequence it should be the last one like in Predators um, in Halloween 2 the end sequences like the last giant big set piece the last battle should be the best the best part but this one is kind of like cut short and it's kind of abrupt and that's why i think the the pteranodon uh cage scene is actually the best scene because i just don't think they do enough with this like it's not as gripping or action-packed as that other scene as it should be much akin to like Friday the 13th part 9 and Freddy's dead like these last sequences are not necessarily well maybe that's not true of Freddy's dead but definitely Friday the 13th and Robocop 2 I just don't think these end scenes are like the best scenes in the movie like they should be um cause like it all happens so fast that it's kind of over and like, like literally the, the William H. Macy scene He's knocked into the water. The crane is destroyed. Everything's on fire. The dinosaur flees. Uh, and they're like, oh my gosh, my husband is dead. Where's William H. Macy? He must be dead. And then he like pops out of the water. With one second later, he's like, I'm still here, babe. And they're like, oh my god. Happens within thirty sec- within 10 seconds. So you don't even get time to be like, oh shit, William H. Macy, he's gone. Because he's right there. Um, and it's just a little rushed. But yeah, so our characters, you know, having been through this harrowing journey having defeated the Spinosaurus, having hopefully made contact to Ellie, are just walking, are continuing their walk to the coast because they're almost there. And, you know, it's at this point that the kid is like, hey, who did you freaking call? We had one call. Who'd you call? Why didn't you call, you know, the government or the FBI or someone? You called some doctor lady. Who'd you call? Um, and he's like, oh, I called Ellie. And he's like, oh... Will this Ellie person... This is a child, by the way. A mere, a very mature child, but I'm a child. He's like, uh, oh, who'd you call? Is that lady going to be able to help us? And he's like, you know, Ellie is the only person I could always count on in my life. I owe her a lot. And you know, I don't think I ever told her that. And it's like, oh, Alan, you love this bitch. And you realize that she's the one for you. She's your road dog. But you're not together. And it seems like Alan is sad about that for like the first time in the movie. Which, like, we want him to be butthurt the whole time. We want her to go and win her back. Why is this not their love story? You know? And maybe in Jurassic World Dominion, or whatever this newest one is, maybe they maybe they flesh that out. Maybe because they're both in this new one. Maybe they're married happily or something. I don't know. I should see it. But, yeah. So, um, they think they're out of the woods, but then, boom, the raptors surround them. As soon as they reach the shore. Because, I forgot to mention this earlier, Alan Grant decided to keep the eggs rather than get rid of them when he found them earlier on Billy's person. Because he said, oh, if we get rid of the eggs now, the raptors are still going to think we're ha- we have their eggs. So they're going to try and come after us whether or not we actually have them. So we might as well have something to give them and be able to give them back and visibly see, he, hey, we have your eggs, take them. Because, you know, they're still going to pursue you and kill you whether or not you have them because they think you have them. Which is actually really freaking smart. Um, But yeah, so Tia Leone, um, Grant slips her the eggs because she's the front of the group. And she's like, oh, here are your eggs, here are your eggs. Um, And then Alan Grant uses the resonating chamber to like, and he makes a bunch of raptor noises or whatever. And it it confuses and disorients the raptors who are trying to communicate and like figure out what to do now that like they have their eggs back and again hey raptors can talk but like if alan grant can use this thing to talk to them they're going to get really confused um but while in their confusion they hear approaching choppers uh and helicopters and i guess that like in the their confusion they're like fuck it let's, let's just leave and they take the eggs and they they bounce um so yeah, again, that's kind of, like, literally, I mean, this movie is not, is like 92 minutes. I just wish, and I understand people's complaints with this part of the ending. I mean, it's not, like, wholly unsatisfying. Believe me. Don't get me, don't get it twisted. 
this is a logical and fine ending to a movie that I have already loved. There's already enough about this movie to bring me in and to bring you, the audience, in. At least I feel. Because, I mean, there's the stuff... There's the initial chase sequence where they land and then the dinosaur crashes and the plane crashes into the dinosaur and the Spinosaurus. Like, all the all three Spinosaurus encounters have been pretty, pretty good. There's a lot of great character stuff. The raptor encounters... The raptor encounter in the first facility. Um, all this stuff is so great and worth the price of admission already. But yeah, this last raptor encounter, like, it's like, oh, here, they're going to leave because you give them the eggs back. Or here, I'm confusing them with the resonator. Or... Uh, here, they're being scared away by the choppers. It's just like too many solutions are presented to this problem in this situation, and it all literally, boom, happens in an instant. Sorry, that snap seems like it resonated loudly. Um, but it's like, it's so quick. And it's just boom, boom, boom. The raptors, oh, they're a problem. Never mind, they're not a problem. It just happened so quickly that I wish they could have fleshed that out or at least been like, you know, either use the resonator to confuse them have ha, you know you give them back the eggs and it appeases them and they go away or have the army choppers whoever's coming to rescue them scare them away you don't need all three and all three boom 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 happening in rapid succession just seems kind of weird and like clumsy i guess but yeah so um it turns out that ellie had gotten word to the army they get to the shore and there's like there's tanks rolling up there's like a, sh a carrier uh and there's a bunch of choppers and like literally like the marine and the marines and the navy are all there uh, and they're like hey we're here to rescue you getting this chopper and then boom somehow I, I gotta stop saying boom i'm too aware of my i just keep saying boom billy is there somehow and he's in a stretcher and he's like getting medical care and they're like, Billy, how the hell are you possibly here? We thought you were dead, dude. Like, Billy's revealed to be alive. And then I forgot to mention also when Alan, f like, w um, went into the water earlier to try to get Billy from the Pteranodons, he lost his hat. He had an Indiana Jones-like hat this entire movie because he's, like, an Indiana Jones archetype, basically, like an adventurer. He has a hat. He's kind of a copycat thing. But uh, he lost his hat. And then Billy is here and even better billy has alan's hat and he's like look alan i found your hat and alan's like cool how are you alive it's not even explained really what, what like who saved him how are you alive where did they find you not explained uh because these guys they get in the chopper and then they fly away and then while they're flying alan grant looks over and he's like huh and because the pteranodons got out and they're just flying next to the chopper and then we follow the pteranodons as they fly into the heavens and just like that the movie's over I wanted to say boom so bad but I didn't and just like that the movie's over like literally the last 15 minutes of this movie could have been probably stretched out into like 25-30 minutes and it would have been more satisfying and it wouldn't have been as quick a rushed feeling but like I like everything they did but just if they had done it in a better way I think it would have been more satisfying. Like, maybe explain what, how Billy's back. Maybe have Ellie be with them and her and Alan embrace. I don't know. Like, the ending is people's biggest criticism, and I do get it. Again, I don't think this movie deserves as much hate as it gets at all. Because people hate this movie pretty much in its entirety. But I kind of get the ending. Like, the, like the movie literally for the first hour and 15 minutes is awesome lights out gangbusters they're killing it but like at the end people have some complaints because it's like abrupt and rushed and i get it because literally the movie's over i don't have any more notes that's it uh there isn't even really like a satisfying line about like life finds a way or you know mr hammond i'm gonna give your park an unsafe grade or whatever nothing like that really it's just kind of over um, but yeah, so I'll, I'll get to like my final stuff. Uh, I must say, yeah, the, the best sequence is not anything after the last, like after the hour and 10 minute mark. It's, um, the Pteranodon cage sequence, which is one of the best sequences in any Jurassic Park movie ever. And the initial landing sequence where they try to take off again, and they crash and 
into the Spinosaurus, and the Spinosaurus like hunts and kills a bunch of their party. That scene is also really awesome. Like, and I think there's a lot of great visual stuff in that last Spinosaurus fight scene, because like I mean, there's the fire on the water, and it's raining, um, and like there's a lot of close-up shots as like the our main characters are like sucked into the water and almost drown. Like that's there's some great stuff there, but it's just too too rushed. Um, best performance, I gotta say, I think it's gotta be Alessandro Nivola who plays Billy Brennan because I think he's actually really great. Um, I think he's like more of a swashbuckling adventurer than Alan Grant is. Like I think he's much more akin to Indiana Jones than even Dr. Grant because I think I mean Dr. Grant's whole thing is that he's like a scientist first and that he's kind of like stiff. Um, at least that's how he was in the, for, the first one and this one he's like less like that. But still I think Billy is more like this is Billy's element. Like, Billy was just like, thanks for bringing me along, and he thrives in this environment. He's a hero. He's, like, an adventurer. And I think Alessandro Nivola does, like, a really great job. And I think I'm genuinely shocked he wasn't in more stuff. Like, he was in Face Off, which was a couple years out, a couple years before this, I think. And then, like, he was in Many Saints of Newark, which came out, like, last year. But, like, between then and now... I saw, I've seen him in virtually nothing. But I think he's really good in this movie. And I think William H. Macy uh, does a serviceable job playing like a dorky, out-of-his-element dad. And the kid is pretty good, because I believe I buy him as like a resourceful teen kid. Michael Jeter kind of gets the short shrift in this movie, because his character... Like, Michael Jeter's a good actor, and like he's been in a lot of stuff. He's very prolific, like I said earlier. Uh, and I think he has, like... I don't know, like maybe 12 like mm, I think I'm gonna go with Dr. Grant on this one like kind of just like throwaway lines I think he was a little underutilized um so yeah I don't know there's some improvements I would make definitely I would definitely like flesh out those ending sequences um like again a lot of great stuff in those ending sequences but just like choose what you're gonna do and like stick with one especially with the, the raptor thing like just stick with one solution of the raptor problem and just like just don't have it be so quick you know uh, I would add more like maybe like this was like a smaller knit group of people than either of the last two movies so I think I could have used more scenes of dinosaurs eating people or killing people just maybe make it a team of five mercenaries, develop the mercenaries a little more, their personalities, and then have them get killed. Like, again, I appreciate that this movie's an hour and 30 minutes, but I wouldn't have been mad if it was an hour and 45 minutes. Because you could have developed, um, like, the Grant and Ellie thing a little more, maybe have, like, Grant... Like, Alan Grant, like, Sam Neill does a, a good job. But I just don't think he has a lot to work with in this movie. Like he's just he's just pissed that he's at the island the whole time. And like maybe give like be like oh I effed up with Ellie. I really love her and I'm never gonna get this year again. Maybe give me some of the stuff like that. Like I don't know. Just like this movie's an hour and a half. Love it if it was an hour forty five. And that being said, of course, there's a lot to like. Like they filmed this movie a lot of it on just like a universal backlot. But it still looks awesome. Like the scene in the river was just like the same back lot that they used for Creature from the Black Lagoon. And I just, it's like, it looks great. It looks awesome. Uh, the fil it was filmed on location in Hawaii, which I, I bet was really expensive. But yeah, it was good. It, like, it looks great. And I uh, personally think that it's like, the script is tight, you know? It's like, there's not a dull moment. There's no fat to trim. This movie is bang, 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 you know? It's got a, it's got a great pace. Um, it really doesn't drag at all. The tension isn't lost, I don't think, at any moment. But that being said, maybe it's a little too rushed. Uh, the creature effects, you know, Stan Winston, the master, uh, is murdering it, you know? I mean, these are the... 
the most advanced animatronics of the time. I mean, they're more advanced than Jurassic Park 1 or 2. It looks awesome. And, of course, I think it's like a blend of visual, of like CGI, computer effects, and practical animatronics. But it's like it looks great. And you can't, you really can't differentiate like what is computer, what is animatronic. Um, it's a great script. It's just like fun and tight and... keeps you on the edge of your seat for the whole time but it's not too long of a time I mean it's just like they're in peril and then there's a quick break and then they're in peril again it's just you know it's light airy breezy not hard to get through like in closing I guess I'll just say that it's simply a great adventure romp like a very akin to the first one it has a lot of those same feelings um and like the same air as the first one and that like oh our characters might die any second but it's kind of fun you know uh, it's definitely just a worthy successor with like characters you actually root for and don't want to die whereas in the first in the second movie I didn't care if any of those characters died at any point because I didn't like them um, so I'll get into some trivia now this movie has some, some incredible trivia actually I'll start off uh, rip and say that the effects crew used 250 gallons of oatmeal to simulate spinosaur droppings. So like the scene where they're like digging through to find the satellite phone at the end was oatmeal. Pretty weird. But I guess that, you know, makes it good for the actors that it's just oatmeal and not actual poop. Not that I for one second thought it was actual poop because that wouldn't make any sense. Um... At around 55 minutes, the, the reveal of the Spinosaurus standing still near the fence, uh, when they hear the satellite phone, they all turn around in terror. Uh, I guess it's one of Stan Winston's favorite shots, like in any movie he's ever been involved with. Um, director Joe Johnston had to keep telling the effects team to like dial back the animal's movement because he wanted it to be as still as possible before the dinosaur burst into a run, which is like how real predators hunt, I guess. They're like absolutely still, but then they bolt. Um... I guess Sam Neill, this is really cool. I really like this. It brought a smile to my face when I read it. Um, he's, like, come to this film's defense, like, a lot, saying that, like, the film got, like, unfair treatment from critics and that he thinks it's, like, a pretty, quote, quote-unquote, a pretty damn good film. So that's nice. Uh, according to an interview with William H. Macy, I guess, speaking of the Spinosaurus animatronic, apparently, according to WHM, that uh, the Spinosaurus had uh, like a 1,000 horsepower motor and that the creature could turn its head at twice the force of gravity Ugh. with the tip of its nose moving at, a, at like at the speed of more than 100 miles per hour. Just crazy. Yeah, this animatronic um, for the Spinosaurus, I guess, was actually like the largest and most advanced ever built at the time. It was 25 feet tall uh, and I guess it's, its length reaching around 40 feet long and it weighed like 24,000 pounds. And it was operated by hydraulics. And, like, this allowed it to operate um, while completely submerged in water. But it ended at, uh, like, just behind the hip. So any other, it, like, so that any shots, like, that showed more than this had to be computer generated. So the tail, I guess. But that's pretty cool. I guess another thing was that... Um, that uh, Stan Winston was really worried about the animatronic being submerged in water because I think there's the scene where a dinosaur bursts through a waterfall in the second one and then it's raining uh, in the first movie with the T-Rex when it initially escapes and he's like I really hope they're not going to do water in this one and I guess he was really worried that the dinosaur animatronic wouldn't hold up in the water in this one but it did uh, Sam Neill as part of his contract requested that the Australian Aust Australasian premiere of this movie uh, take place in his hometown of uh, Dunedin, New Zealand weird uh, when asked why he accepted the role of Paul Kirby William H. Macy replied because I'm 50 years old and I get to fight with a dinosaur which is kind of a badass William H. Macy answer Steven Spielberg St Spielberg, Spielberg Sp Steven Spielberg let me put some respect on the man's name for God's sake 
uh, initially devised a story idea which involved uh, Alan Grant living on one of InGen's islands to like further study dinosaurs, uh, and that he would like live in like a bungalow because he was not allowed in for research officially. But uh, Joe Johnson actually ballsy move on his part rejected uh, Steven Spielberg's ideas because he couldn't imagine Dr. Grant returning to the island or like any island inhabited by dinosaurs after like almost being killed by them in the first movie. Which like I gotta say, um, Joe Johnston, you're like that actually makes perfect sense. Like that's like I don't know. Yeah, I think you made the right call. Uh, like I said, oh, the velocirating, the velociraptor resonating chamber that Billy shows Dr. Grant is actually a dog's. Uh, Jeff Goldblum <laughs> confirmed in an interview that he was not invited back to reprise his role as Ian Malcolm, even though he would have. They, they didn't want him, which I don't blame him. That character sucks. Um, <laughs> and he was like, he was like everyone's like least favorite character from Jurassic Park 1. He's so annoying. And then like, he's like, oh, the main character in the second one? Uh, oh, they say in the movie that the Spinosaurus was absent from the list of dinosaurs created by InGen, so like both Billy and Alan are surprised that it's on the island, but uh, its existence is left unanswered. Like they're like, "Huh, that wasn't on the, the InGen list," but then it's never, it's never answered. The vocalizations of the Spinosaurus were created by mixing together the low guttural sounds of a lion and an alligator, a bear cub crying, and a lengthened cry of a large bird. Uh, the shooting began before there was a, f a final script in place and there was no ending in place the whole time um, so I guess uh, it was like a really uh, kind of nerve-wracking kind of hectic uh, shooting because they just like, they had no idea what they were going to do from day to day um, John Williams was contracted or contacted, sorry, to write the music, but was actually busy writing the music for Steven Spielberg's AI, artificial intelligence. So Don Davis was chosen as uh, the composer. It's the first Jurassic Park movie without a book counterpart because uh, Jurassic Park, you know, was an established book by Michael Crichton, and then Steven Spielberg and David Kep adapted it, and then. They, they, Michael Crichton wrote the Lost World Jurassic Park in 1995, and then they adapted that into a movie in 1997. And then for this one, they were just flying by the seat of their pants. And uh, I think, uh, all things considered, it worked out. Um, Stan Winston explains why the integration of live action and CG effects helps actors' performances because he says that, um, he says an animatronic dinosaur gives the actors something to react to rather than just a tennis ball on a stick. And then any CG effects that are added afterward just enhances the level of reality of the scene itself for like you, the viewer. Uh, according to Masrani Global website, John Hammond was actually dead in like this universe by the time of the events of this movie. So between 1997 and 2001, he passed away, supposedly. A full-size uh, pteranodon suit, I guess, was made but never used in the movie because I think they used animatronics and CG, so, like, uh, nothing that a person could get inside even though that was made. So that's pretty neat. Pretty neat. Yeah. Shut up. Um... <laughs> Joe Johnston had originally lobbied to direct the Lost World Jurassic Park but uh, was turned down when Spielberg decided to return. Uh, and to make up for this, Spielberg passed on the, the director's, uh, like, passed on directing this movie to allow Johnston to do it. Um, and then he decided to do AI instead. So, because they released the same year. Uh, this is the only film in this original trilogy where InGen, the company, is not involved in the plot at all. Oh, yeah, some of these casting what-ifs are really cool. I guess Stellan Skarsgård, Steve Buscemi, and Tony Shalhoub were all considered for the role of of Cooper. Which I guess maybe they all passed on it because Cooper is like the first mercenary to die and it's a really small role, but like I could I would have loved to see one of those guys. Tony Shalhoub is a mercenary. Um That'd be sick. Uh, 
uh, I guess um, William H. Mace, I guess, like I said, it was a troubled, a troubled shoot. And I guess during like an interview in 2000, William H. Macy was quoted as saying, uh, there have been all the problems that one can think of. The script has been evolving and being written as we go. Um, and what you want to say is, who launched a $100 million ship without a, uh, without a rudder? And who's getting fired for this? But that's the way it goes. That's the way they make these movies big deal. I think someone should be shot, but I'm not in charge. But then like later on, he, um, he was quoted as saying, I think there will be a further sequel, and I took great pains to drop my wallet on one of those islands, so I have an excuse to go back. So even though he was shit-talking it, I guess he eventually came around and was just like, yeah, I think doing this was really fun. Uh, Joe Johnston thought about quitting the project on many occasions because of the uncertainty of how the film would do, considering that it did not have a finished script. He said that making the film was uh, a living hell on a daily basis, a business, biz, basis, and that shooting without a finished script was nerve-wracking. But that was also kind of uh, freeing up the whole creative process because they could literally decide on the day how we wanted the scene to progress. And he said, uh, he's like, yeah, it's not the way to make movies necessarily. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but it gives you a little more freedom. And um, he said that the actors were very flexible and that helped. Yeah. Um, yeah, but uh, Sam Neill said that uh, he said we were flying by the seat of our pants. And even though... Uh, Bill Macy and Taylor Leone didn't seem happy. I enjoyed making it. Uh, Joe Johnston was wonderful to work with. Alessandro, who plays my number two in the film, he and I really got along well. It's really sweet to hear. Um, he think, and he said that like yeah, it's a, a very undervalued film and really worth having a look at again. It finishes rather abruptly, but for all its difficulties, because it, because it became inevitable that we would start shooting on the first day of November or whatever it was, and they kept changing the script. Um, he said, it, he said, for all that being considered, it works real good and that there's some really good stuff in it, which I think that's so sweet when actors stand by their movies. The T-Rex animatronic was actually the same animatronic used for uh, Jurassic Park 2. I want to find those casting what-ifs. I wrote it down somewhere. Oh, man. Uh, where is that? Where is that? Where is that? Oh, so, well, this is not the same thing, but I guess Steven Summers and Jan de Bont were both in the running to direct when Steven Spielberg declined. Uh, I'm glad I went to Joe Johnston because I think he's better at, like, comfy adventure films. Uh, but, like, uh, St you know, Jan de Bont and Steven Summers, I think, both might have done a cool job. Uh, oh, yeah, Kate Blanchett, Sharon Stone, Lisa Kudrow... Marsha Cross, Sarah Jessica Parker, Cynthia Nixon, and Brooke Shields were considered for the role of Amanda Kirby. Now, like, Brooke Shields, Lisa Kudrow, Sharon Stone, and Kate Blanchett, I would have loved any of those. All of those would have been great. I think all of those probably would have been better than Tia Leone. <laughs> Hopefully she doesn't come after me. That would be awful. But, you know, I just got to be honest. Um, okay, and Gabriel Byrne, Ray Liotta, Robert Patrick, William Sadler, M Mark Harmon, Stephen Lang, Liam Neeson, Andy Garcia, and Matthew Broderick were considered for the role of Paul Kirby. And whether those actors um, were were passed on or they passed themselves, I actually think that William H. Macy is probably the best choice out of all those guys. I think um, Gabriel Byrne, Ray Liotta, Robert Patrick, William Sadler, Mark Harmon, Liam Neeson, and Andy Garcia would have all been too like domineering and like confident and tough guys to play like a whelp who doesn't know what he's doing is out of his element um and like matthew Broderick probably would have been like too yuppie -y to do it so i think actually that william h macy was the best choice Oh, an uh, interesting one. Uh, one of the reasons that Tyrannosaurus is not featured in this movie very much is because the animatronic puppet was damaged at the neck. Uh, because the Spinosaurus animatronic was so big and powerful that it destroyed the robot with one hit. And I guess this left many of the crew stunned, shocked, and even some, some of them mourned for the animatronic. Uh, with Joe Rosengrant saying that, that was a really sad ending to a long night of shooting. 
The spino threw one final blow and broke the T-Rex's neck. The head collapsed, the neck tore open in the back, and the hydraulic fluid shot out of it, almost like blood spurting. Because of this mishap, I guess this would eventually be the scene where the Spinosaurus towers over the T-Rex after killing it. So I guess uh, uh, people were pretty bummed out. Uh, the original script had Billy Brennan being actually killed, but I guess the actor uh, Alessandro Nivola protested and director John Johnston, or Joe Johnston, I'm sorry, um, and eventually came around and brought him back to the end. A uh, first time in the franchise that a T-Rex is killed in a raptor is not. I guess the Tyrannosaurus' death originally lasted much longer. Uh, the Spinosaurus would have bitten its neck and literally would have choked the life out of it. Uh, but And tearing chunks out of its neck while it did that. But I guess it was deemed too gory. And was in change, you know, changed to a, a neck snap. Uh, I guess also there's a fan theory that this, that the that the that the like the not quite adult T-Rex that's killed by the Spinosaurus in this movie is actually the infant T-Rex from Jurassic Park: The Lost World. I don't know how the timetables work exactly, but um, I I could see that. The Spinosaurus has only three minutes of scream time, despite scream time, screen time, despite being like the main um, dinosaur antagonist, I guess, of the movie. Uh, yeah, it is unknown how Billy survived, but it can be assumed that he just washed down river to um, to the shore because that's where they were going anyway, and was found by the rescue party. But again, you could have just said that. Um, okay, what did I? Oh yeah, okay. I just uh, I guess uh, I'll do like I, I I researched some articles and I'll just do like some rankings really quick. Uh, or I'll just discuss some of the rankings and articles that I found. Uh, first one's from Collider by uh, uh, Perry N N Nemiroff, uh, and which ranks the Jurassic Park movies from worst to best. Um, Jurassic uh, World Fallen Kingdom was ranked as the worst, whereas Jurassic Park 3 came in fifth. So Jurassic Park 3, according to Collider, is like the second worst Jurassic Park movie, with, I believe... Um, Jurassic World Dominion, The Lost World, Jurassic Park being next, then Jurassic World and number two, and Jurassic Park at number one, classically. Um, I think all of these have Jurassic Park at number one, and that's, you know, pretty obvious. But, you know, there's some nuance and some variation in the in the others. Uh, oh, this uh, Vulture article, courtesy of who wrote this? Uh, by Tim Grierson and Will Will Leach, uh, actually ranks Jurassic Park 3 as the worst one. Saying, But then also they go on to say that Jurassic World is in number 5, Jurassic World Dominion at number 4, Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom at number 3, and then The Lost World and Jurassic Park OG is number 1. Which, like, no offense, I'm discrediting this Vulture article right now. It take It took two people to um, I'll come up with these bogus whack opinions. Jurassic World is definitely like not number five. Sorry. Um, and again, I'll give you guys all the links to these articles so you can, you know, compare yours. You know, rank them yourself. Do some comparison like we usually do. So, um, so this uh, Screen Rant article, which ranks them by watchability, uh, has Jurassic World: Fallen Kingdom at number six. Jurassic Park 3 is number 5 again. Jurassic World Dominion at number 4. The Lost World Jurassic Park at number 3. Jurassic World at number 2. And Jurassic Park at number 1. And then lastly, I'll discuss a Parade. A Parade article written by Samuel Marion. Oh, I'm sorry. The Screen Rant article was written by... I want to give credit here. Uh, ben Sherlock. All of these articles coming in like, you know coming in the wake of the release of Jurassic World Dominion. So the Parade article has Jurassic World Dominion in last place, uh, with Jurassic Park 3 at number 5th. So yeah, Jurassic Park 3 is either dead last or just about dead last in all of these uh, rankings. Um, personally, though, 
I love this movie, as you know. My rankings, it is much higher. Uh, my rankings go Jurassic Park at number... Well, no, I'll go... I'll go. I'll, Jurassic Park's not my number one, obviously, because it's going to be everyone's number one, because it's one of the best movies ever made. Um, but, like, I think... And I haven't seen Jurassic World Dominion yet, so I, you know... I'll just rank the five that I've seen. So... Last, I'm sorry to say, but I'm gonna gonna I'm gonna have to put the Lost World Jurassic Park. I really n- uh, do not care for that movie as much as people do love it apparently, and I respect their opinions. It is not my opinion. I and I'll give an I'll I'll give it a courtesy watch this week sometime, and I'll let you know, or maybe in the off, maybe when I'm off for two weeks. But I'm just like I I'm just not keen on that movie. So it goes Jurassic, the Lost World Jurassic Park, then in fi- then in fourth. Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom then I would go Jurassic Park 3 and I know that's probably a shocker because you maybe thought it would be higher but I do really love Jurassic World I think Jurassic World is high in people's esteem and it should be because it's really great Um, and then Jurassic Park number 1 of course Um, and lastly I would like to just read um, some stuff that I found because I guess um in recent years, in the wake of the release of Jurassic World and all of the sequels, I guess there has been like retrospective assessments of this movie, uh, like people revisiting it and being like, "Oh, you know, it's actually pretty good." So I just thought I'd I'd share some of that with you because it makes my heart feel warm and makes me feel good. Um, so yeah, in like um, like these later reviews have been very positive with actual like critics actually declaring it superior to the Lost World Jurassic Park. <laughs> I knew it all along, but whatever. Uh, I'll, I'm glad for this movie. But yeah, retrospective reviews have also um, praised like the aviary sequence, like with the Pteranodon, right? Because it's the best. But yeah, Simon Brew, writing for Den of Geek, stated in 2007 that the film has an efficiency and a focus that was missing in the previous film. See, which is exactly what I was saying, right? It's like, it's like on point. It's like high, the script is high and tight. It knows where it's going. And it's just bop, bop, bop along. Whereas, like, Jurassic World, or no, Jurassic, like, The Lost World, kind of just wanders aimlessly. And, like, there's so many points in that movie that it just loses all tension and direction. Um, and, like, Simon uh, Simon Brew, I guess, enjoyed the set pieces, but criticized the abrupt ending. Um, but yeah, several critics reviewed the film in 2015, like I said, when Jurassic World was released. Justin Harp of Digital Spy wrote that despite the shortcomings of Jurassic Park 3, it remains immensely watchable and visually impressive. It manages to strike a clear balance between moments of terror and genuine laughs. Although Harp did consider the film to be the black sheep of the series, black sheep of the series, he described it as fresh, exciting, and most of all, a whole lot of fun. Uh, Entertainment Weekly in 2018 wrote that what the plot lacks in credibility, it makes up for in relatability. Uh, The magazine praised it as the only film in the series that has zero to do with scientific stupidity or sinister corporate forces, writing uh, that it was perhaps the most narratively original film out of all of them. Which, like, I get that, because, like, I mean, like, it's like all these scientists and, like, research, and they're talking about how dinosaurs came back, and, like, all there's all this, like, because, like, there's a paleobotanist, paleontologist. There's all these different scientists and experts thrown around this jargon. And I don't know if that every man necessarily understands. Or, like, corporate espionage between, like, companies wanting to use a dinosaur DNA and recreate them for profit. It's just, like, I think this is, like, the most, like, easily attainable. And, like, a person can really just grab onto this movie and go for a ride without any qualms or hang-ups about it. So, yeah, I just thought that that was really great. How, like, um, and also I just think the idea of people like i mean like retrospective assessments of movies like how people loved american beauty but now after this kevin spacey stuff they're like oh maybe that movie isn't as good i just love the idea obviously of people giving movies second chances second third fourth chances because like you never really i don't know it's just like it all depends on that moment in time that you saw it what was going on there's so many external and internal factors that can like 
affect how you see a movie. Like, coming off the heels of, like, one and two, and you're viewing that, is, like, so much different than, like, now viewing it as its own thing, or viewing it in the wake of, like, the Jurassic World movies kind of shitting the bed. Um, it's just, like, I'm glad that people are able to revisit. And, I mean, of course, that's, like, the whole thing I'm trying to do here, is I just want people to, like, shed some light on these movies and realize that, like, there's a lot to like. Um, this, I, uh, despite the fact that I guess this movie actually was uh, nominated for the worst remake or sequel at the Golden Raspberry Awards in 2002. Didn't win, but it was nominated, which is insulting. Because, uh, again, can't tell you how much I love this movie, really. Um, really, it's like so. It's just so much fun. It's just... And it's not one of those movies that, too, you just put on and it just fades into the background while you do other things. Like, this is a movie where if you want to sit down and have and have some fun, just have, like, a real romp, just have, like, a real... It's just a, it's just a treat, you know? It's just fun. You sit down, you put your, you know, you put your fists up to your cheek and you just cock your head, your feet are kicked back, and you're just... You just bask in it, you know? I mean, and you're not, you're not like, oh, hmm... Mm, this script, it's magnificent. It's just like, you know, it has its flaws, but they can be overlooked. Uh, and I just think it's a joy. And uh, we've actually uh, beaten our record for longest episode today uh, with Jurassic Park 3, 2 hours and 16 minutes. It's like 45 minutes longer than the actual movie, and 4 minutes longer than our longest episode up until this point. So I just, uh, I think that's awesome. Small victories, you know. Uh, but anyway, uh, I'm coming back to you next week for the final episode of Sequel Summer. Um, you know, cry, I cry. Um, very sad, but also, you know, I'm grateful that it happened. And I'm grateful to you, the listeners, whoever you are out there. Um, and I am glad that we have went on this journey together. And I, um, yeah, I'll be coming to you next week live with Jaws 2. So that'll be fun. I've been waiting for that all all season. Jaws two, not only one of my, like my probably my favorite movie in this batch that we've done, but just like a, a personal fave of mine that I really love. Um, right up there, I I actually, maybe I'm wrong for this objectively, but I almost consider it just as good as Jaws one, and I just really like it, and I can't wait to talk about it, and I um, I'm excited to bring that to you, and I. Uh, I thank you for listening now uh, and in the past and in the future. So um, thank you again for your time so much, and I hope everyone has a pleasant evening, and thank you for uh, going down um, this path of of Jurassic Park 3 with me. Uh, And I'll see you next week. All right, goodbye. Also, I just looked it up, and I totally lied because the record is not 212, which was Alien vs. Predator, or Alien Resurrection. It was actually set by my Halloween 2 episode, which is 2 hours and 18 minutes and 30 seconds. So I'm just going to go ahead and try to pad this episode for 30 more seconds to try to beat that record because I really just want to, because I do want that personal victory. And I know I probably should just edit out that last part where I like, oh, the personal victories beat the record. That was the wrong record. But uh, I don't edit, as you know, um, because it's I like to let you in on my process and I don't like to keep anything from you, but also because I'm kind of lazy. Um, but yeah, that's it. I, um, again, I appreciate you listening. Boom. There we are. We just beat it. (laughs) And I know it's kind of silly of me to do that anyway, but again, thank you so much for listening and thank you for being me, being with me here on this momentous occasion where we claimed the new record for longest episode of movies you missed. Uh, and you know, I'll see you next week. All right. Bye. This time for real.